uh, welcome everybody uh, to today's uh, exciting edition on our webinar on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Both speakers have agreed to recording, so the lectures uh, will be recorded and uploaded to the ICMRBS YouTube channel, probably by tomorrow or so. Uh, I also remind you to use the Q&A box for putting a question or raise your hand, and then we can unmute you. And I would really like to remind everybody to stay on after the official part to the unofficial part, because then we can have further discussion. And uh, that's always very nice, actually. Uh, uh, and there's also this early career researcher uh, edition of the webinar, uh, which I uh, encourage you to uh, participate. Without further ado, then I hand over the uh, stage to uh, Professor Wüttrich, uh, who agreed to introduce uh, the first speaker of today. Well, thank you and hello to everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Sebastian Hiller, who has been a diploma student at the ETH Zürich in my group. Then he was a PhD student who also spent half a year in my laboratory in La Jolla. He was very successful as a graduate student, and it was clear that he was a big promise for an academic career. After publishing more than 10 papers as a graduate student, he moved on to work with Gerhard Wagner, where he does very highly visible work on human VDAC-1. He then completed his education by joining Beat Meyer at CETH Zürich to do some solid state NMR. And fortunately enough, he was very sensible and returned to solution NMR, where he is now pursuing a most uh, impressive career at the University of Basel. With this, Sebastian, please, it's your time. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, it was actually a big surprise for me and a great pleasure to see you here today. Um, and I want to start also thanking the organizers, not so much maybe for inviting me, but for doing this whole series. I think it's a fantastic thing that brought us very well through the Corona times and has connected us across the globe in the community. I think it's a fantastic thing here. I would like, um, and so, okay, welcome. Also, I would welcome everybody out there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for, for being here. I would like to share with you today our work on the outer membrane insert phase. Um, this is a huge, gigantic uh, protein complex of about 250 kilodalton. You can see this here on the right hand side. And um, this has fascinated us for, for quite a while. And, and this did it so for two reasons. The one is its structural biology. This protein is the beta barrel membrane protein that folds and inserts other beta barrel membrane proteins into the outer membrane. And I will, in the first part of my talk, explain the, the structural and functional biology of this huge complex here. And the second big interest came, we, we realized this a bit while we were on the way, the BAM complex has long been recognized as, a, as an interesting target for novel antibiotics. We, we um, have the antibiotics crisis still going on. We, we, right now it's a bit out of focus of interest, maybe because of, of Corona, but the resistances are worldwide on the rise and, and gram-negative bacteria are a threat to human health. And it has always been considered that a target that is on the outer surface of the bugs is, is, um, would be very valuable. And because for such targets, the bacteria cannot use their typical defense mechanisms, such as efflux pumps, enzymatic de degradation, and other. And BAM-A is one of the two essential, the only two essential targets in the outer membrane of bacteria, of gram-negative bacteria, and therefore it has been a prime target um, for antibiotics. And I will show this in the second part of my talk, how antibiotics actually exploit the functional mechanism to, uh, in their mode of action. Okay, an introduction here on the biogenesis pathway on of outer membrane proteins. So they are synthesized here in the cytoplasm by the ribosome. You see this here in blue, the OMS coming out here, and then chaperones take them up. They're translocated across the inner membrane and then through the periplasm bound by other chaperones here, skip and sir A. Um, and these chaperones bring the unfolded outer membrane proteins to the outer membrane. And there we have insertases. This is the TAM 
protein or here the BUM complex that I just showed before, and they fold and insert the OMS into the outer membrane. And this is a, a central function. So this protein complex BUM, which consists out of the central unit BUM A, which is the beta barrel, and five of these domains here, they're called potra domains. And there's another four proteins, BUM B, BUM C, BUM D, and BUM E, to make up this entire complex. And the proteome of a, of a typical bacterium is big. You, you probably are aware of this. These are these typical beta barrels that we have in huge variety to from the pores and to insert uh, pores and, and other channels for nutrient intake into the outer membrane. And all of these are created essentially by the BUM complex. There's very few of them done by the alternative TAM pathway. So we are interested and very interested how is the structure of the BUM complex, how is its functional mechanism, and then how can we use it as a target for, for inhibition of antibiotics. We determined the structure of the TAM-A, um, that's the homologue of BUM-A in, in 2013, and I quickly review this here to give you an insight into the structure. So we have these potra domains here in the periplasm. The TAM has, has only three of them, the BUM-A has five of them, and then there's a 16-stranded beta barrel. And this here goes all the way, strand one up here, then two, three, blah, 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 all the way up to 16. And the last strand is now really special in both TAME and BAME because it can kink here in about uh, the middle of the barrel and basically open a lateral gate here at the bottom. At the same time, this barrel is closed at the top, unlike many other um, outer membrane proteins whose function is to make a passage uh, uh, across the membrane. So this is a, has a lid on top, therefore is very stable here and therefore can allow an opening on the, on the side. And so the functional mechanism, we figured this out after determining the structure, is basically that um, the chaperones, they bring client proteins in a highly denatured form. So they bring them in a, in a fluidic um, state across the aqueous periplasm. And then those make a contact with the bum or tum barrel and start inserting hairpins and forming a transient hybrid barrel in this hybrid barrel, you also have the chance to translocate a passenger domain across the lumen of this big thing. And then this is here on the outside. And in the final step, you can butt off and have the membrane protein inserted. And our protein, which is actually a catalyst, is nothing else than a catalyst, is back in its original state. And this whole thing is driven in terms of free energy by the free energy of folding and insertion of the substrates from their denatured state into the final structure. In the meantime, so we, we had uh, hypothesized this uh, mechanism based on considerations of the structure. And in the meantime, this is uh, pretty well established, I would say, by a number of experiments from many labs that this is the, the mechanism how it works. We then um, became a bit puzzled and, and, um, by some reports that um, reported on the folding, uh, on, on, on the, the folding mechanism of such other membrane protein substrates into the membrane. Because um, there can reports that this would be a very slow process with many intermediate states, like here up to, sometimes up to seven or, or, or thermodynamic intermediate states, and would be a very slow process. We knew it, it was a slow process. This was, was generally known. And the question was a bit, is this now a multi-step process, or is it actually only a rare process? Uh, because this has, of course, direct consequences for the possibility to catalyze this. And to bring this in agreement with our structural data, we decided to study the folding mechanism and insertion process of such a small OMP substrate into the membrane. We did this here, and I show you the two basic experiments that you can do. So we can study the folding of this OMP X protein by SDS page. You can see a nice S band shift, whether the protein is folded or not. And with this, you can observe the global folding kinetics in a, in a very a clear way this is, is routinely done. We can also monitor this by fluorescence spectroscopy and we see the kind of same folding kinetics. This is all good. We then use NMR to measure actually the formation kinetic of individual hydrogen bonds during the folding process. And we did this, we wanted to study this into lipid bilayers, not into detergent micelles, because this is the, the native situation. And so um, what, what you see here is this NMR spectrum of OMBX, our model substrate. And we can now incubate this in, with, with D2O, so initiate the folding process under D2O conditions, and then truncate at certain chosen time points towards H2O, and in this way, get um, the kinetics of the hydrogen bond formation during the folding. And we have done this for all the stable residues that are here in the barrel, all the others that exchange later during the 
preparation process for those we, we do not have data, they don't form stable hydrogen bonds. But for the entire barrel, because we fold this into the lipid bilayer and then extract it with detergent to, to make solution anymore, we get homogeneous kinetic rate constants for the hydrogen bond formation. So it's basically within the arrow bar, all forming with this identical rate. From this, you could already conclude that we have a two-state folding. We additionally validate this by, by HD exchange mass spectrometry, where we see a direct transition from the protonated to the deuterated form during the folding time. And this also fits very nicely to a folding rate constant, which is identical to the other ones. So here we clearly see there's no intermediates. And so um, we come up with this conclusion. I think this is a very important point here that in fact, the insertion process of at least this small eight-stranded OMP substrate is a two-step process going directly from an unfolded to the native form in a cooperative manner, but is not a slow multi-state process. And this is important because now you can, of course, readily catalyze this, and this is what our BAM and TAM do. So they have to lower the transition state barrier, um, for example, by bringing this first hairpin into the membrane and then the rest of the folding happens to have very rapidly. Okay, now let's go to the to the BAM protein, to the to the big beta barrel that is the catalyst. We have here this BAM A barrel, and we started on working with this. And our initial spectra looked a bit like this. So we have the entire um, protein here, only the transmembrane beta barrel part with the potra domains truncated, and we see this kind of spectrum, which is of okay average quality, but we see a lot of line splitting. I'm showing this here enlarged on the right hand side. So for many of the residues, um, we do have two resonance lines. Here's some examples. Um, I'm already showing the assignments here, which we, we don't have yet at that point <laughs> originally, but now we know them. So this was the or original state. What did we do to, to overcome this? Um, we, we are here in an extreme situation. The whole, whole protein has more than 400 residues and um, we cannot move ahead with backbone assignments in this state. So what we did is actually we developed confirmation specific nanobodies for either of these two states. So we have two of them. So the one is called E6, that's the, if you will, the red nanobody. And this nanobody, if it binds to BAM-A, it selects one peak out of the ensemble. You see here for these examples, there is all the splitting of the, of the resonance in two peaks and then this nanobody Picks out one. Here's a crystal structure of that complex, and we can see that the lateral gate here at the 16th strand is now open. Another nanobody that we identified, actually by screening NMR spectra in the end, um, would stabilize the closed state, the other state. So if you do this, you have the blue spectrum, and then the respective other state is uh, here selective. And in this structure, the, the last strand is fully zipped up and is closed. So this is a very good method to now produce or be able to um, clarify the NMR spectra and have a single state um, available for the further work. We, however, did not want to work in the presence of the nanobody because it still increased the molecular size and complicating the spectra. So what we did instead is we made a variant where we elongated this last strand by nine additional residues. And here's again a crystal structure that completely zipped up here all the way along. And you see this resembles uh, pretty much this, this closed state. And so with this version, we got rather good NMR spectra. They will agree they're much better than the ones before. And with this, we could now work. So we did establish the backbone assignment of this, this BAM A plus nine construct in LDO detergent micelles. And um, this is what we got after quite some hard work. The way um, we did this is, um, using on the one hand conventional experiments, draw CH and CA um, to get connectivities, but you will agree that with 400 residues, there is a lot of um, overlap and, and a lot of uh, assignment ambiguities. So we had to use a lot of specific labeling and used also nosy contacts to, oops, to jump across strands. So basically establish such connections. And of course, this was all based on the um, knowledge of the atomic structure already from crystallization. I cannot make a strong statement whether we would have succeeded in the absence of the structure um, because simply we didn't do that experiment, but here's the assignment we got. It's not yet fully complete, um, but it covers the barrel to a large extent and we also see important regions here up in the loop. So what is green 
here is the assigned residues. Okay, what do we do now with this? Um, we now move to the uh, part where we are interested in the interaction with um, novel antibiotics. And the first one is the antibiotic darobactin. And this is actually a very intriguing compound. You can see the chemical structure here at the bottom. This compound is a heptameric peptide that was found, this is a natural compound that was found in, in screening efforts by my colleague Kim Lewis in Boston. And he's a microbiologist and he screened rare bacterial species for such compounds. And, um, so for, for antibiotically active compounds. And we found this in, in Photoraptus, that's a, a, a species that lives in the guts of, of nematodes in a symbiotic way. And you see it's a hepta peptide and it has two tryptophanes that are covalently cross-linked back to the C-beta atom of the residue that is two adjacent in sequence. So here's a carbon-carbon bond that is unusual and here is an um, ether bond that is unusual. This is done by, by radical chemistry. So this was the compound. And the first task was, of course, to find out whether this does um, inhibit uh, BAM-A. I'll show you here the activity. Uh, um, this, is a, this compound is broadly active, so it's uh, active against different bacterial species, Pseudomonas, Shigella, E. coli, of course, also um, somewhat acinetobacter. And it's not active against human cell lines, also not against gut bacteria, which makes it actually very promising compound for, for future use. So now what we did is we took the BAM um, spectrum and you remember this is the split spectrum with multiple conformations. And at the moment we add the darobactin, this very beautifully um, cleans up and populates a single state of course leading immediately to much better spectrum with, with uh, single intensities. And then further titration didn't improve much. And if we look now at the 2D NMR spectrum, we see that for those residues where we have a peak splitting before, this is all, we select one conformation and this corresponds to the, to the closed state that we also found with the nanobody. Here again, there's those two nanobodies, the blue one and the red one. And we have a spectrum that is always matching the closed state. So the darobactin seems to bring the bum in its closed state. Now, um, here's the cryo-EM structure of the complex, which we did here also in, in Basel. Um, as the entire BAM complex now, we have again the BAM A barrel here on top, and here those helper proteins, BAM B, C, D, E, and the Rebactin now very nicely binds here exactly at the gate, at the place where we did this strand elongation of the last strand to uh, stabilize the barrel. So the Rebactin does the same thing and binds here. And this is the binding site, and there's a very um, unusual and, and the binding site that has not been seen like this in any other complex before. You can see here, we have the beta strand one of BAM A. So we are looking here now from the inside um, of, the, of the BAM A barrel towards the membrane. And so this darobactin molecule now makes canonical backbone hydrogen bonds from its own backbone to the backbone of BAM A, oops, sorry. And has these two tryptophan rings that are, have these chemical cross links pointing towards the membrane. So this interface is actually, so, so this binding pocket has actually a very unique comp composition. It consists about to a third of, of protein, a third of the membrane and a third of aqueous solution. And the compound is perfectly evolved to, to bind that site. And by the fact that it has mainly here backbone interaction uh, also makes it very robust against single point mutations uh, that would lead them to bacterial resistance, which is a, a big, big plus I think for this compound. We also made tests of this, the, the fixation of these tryptophanes in, in covalent rings dramatically increases the affinity. Um, it pre-orders the compound in beta strand conformation. You can see here an overlay of now the, the solution enema structure, which is here in, in beige. And this structure is, is rigid and those two rings and only that part here is um, serine six and phenylalanine seven are flexible and dynamic. And this matches perfectly with the structure that we got out of the complex. So the thing is pre-oriented there by increasing the, the and decreasing the entropic penalty you have to pay for binding um, and, and leading to high affinity. And if you would take only the linear peptide, that's what we did, then the compound doesn't bind anymore. Now, what is remarkable is that the natural substrates, they always have a beta signal to be, so a, a signal sequence that is called the beta signal to be recognized by the bump complex. You can see this here. We have the bioinformatic consensus sequence here on top. So 
for starting from this last residue, which is in most cases of vinyl allen, we always have a pattern here of hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic residues and so on going backwards. And the darobactin perfectly mimics this uh, sequence. So you can see a match here of this vinyl alanine um, and here this hydrophobic, hydrophilic pattern, maybe with this exception, but this lysine is actually also making a nice contact with a lipid in the membrane. And so not only have we an, a new antibiotic, but we've also discovered the position where the signal sequence of the substrate binds. It's in exactly in this place and this phenyl alanine, this terminal one goes in a nice pocket here between these residues and is recognized here. So the mechanism of action, now connecting the work here to the folding studies I showed earlier is like this, our chaperones bring the unfolded um, membrane protein in, in these dynamic fluidic states. They make a contact here. The signal sequence is here. The C terminus is being recognized by BAM for the folding and insertion of this catalytic event, the single hairpin insertion. And now Darabactin um, spoils the game, binds here to this place um, and you know, hinders the process, thereby um, killing the bacteria. BAM as such is essential. If this is blocked, there is no more biogenesis of other membranes. And Darabactin can do this though because it has a higher local affinity due to these crosslinks higher than any of the signal sequences that you find. Okay, and then I would like to share with you uh, the other antibiotic that also came onto the radar very recently. This is here the compound Omta from a company here in Basel, Polyphor. And they also um, developed this for quite some time. So this is the ring here um, called Moripavadin. This is a cyclic peptide and the polymix in another cyclic pe peptide. That's actually an antibiotic on its own. At the moment when you have this R position here, this aliphatic chain, but they removed the aliphatic chain, fused those two things together and made some more variations. Um, all the details can, can be found here um, and came up with this class of compounds. And again, these compounds were developed in the absence of any known target. And it was then um, at the time our contribution to show how and if that actually targets BAM A. First of all, again here, showing quickly the the activity spectrum. This is again a broadband antibiotic um, active against all of the relevant gram negative species that we would like to um, fight uh, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, E. coli, Klebsiella, and it has extremely good activity here. So it's also a very promising compound for the future. Of course, you see this here, it cannot target a gram positive bacterium. It would be strange because they don't have an outer membrane, so they don't have BAMA. And with our NMR assignments, um, in the spectrum, we could now clearly show that this compound does bind BAM A um, by chemical shift perturbation. You'll see this here, and it's actually binding here on the top. We, we clearly identify here the residues with the strongest chemical shift perturbation, and they're all located here. We don't know yet exactly how it binds. It could somehow bind in here or lean on, on top of that, perhaps again stabilize uh, the, the protein in a certain conformation. We see this again here. The closed and the open state, oops, sorry, the closed and the open state, so the compound does again stabilize the closed state. Um, and this may be in an allosteric way come where, coming somewhere from up here, down here. And we hope we can resolve also this better in the future. With this, I'm at the end of my presentation. I would thank the team that did a fantastic job here. Handy, Kaur, and Roman Jakob are the two leading authors of this um, Darabactin work and T Roman is in, in the group of Tim Meyer, my good friend and colleague here with whom we are collaborating on this family of projects for, for many years now. Part did the folding study of the OMBAC substrate into the membrane and Elia also helped with the bioinformatics. These are former members that contributed. With collaborations of so Kim Lewis and, and Jan Obrecht are the, the sources of the, of the antibiotics. And we have some MD simulation also in this very integrative structural biology project that I, I don't have time to show here. Also some native mass spec with Karen Robinson and Michael Seger did the selection of the nanobodies with us. I would thank my funding sources and thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, Sebastian, for a fantastic talk. I'm not sure if Kurt is still there. Um, yes, I think I'm on again. 
Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, well, thank you for a most exciting talk. It's really impressive how you went from OMPEX to BAM A and uh, got this all done. Very nice work. I'm going to the question and answer desk, and there are no open questions. So let me ask you a first question. You impressed us by showing how you got almost complete sequence specific assignments for BAM A. And you also mentioned that you had the three dimensional structure available to support you in some critical points. Now, this is a very major achievement, but my question is why did you go into this very uh, extensive work for what you want to do? Why did you not rather go to selective labeling to study the interactions with the drug? Yes, very, very good point. And the answer is because all of this happened in parallel um, and happened very rapidly. And so we um, did, um, I, I think, go for the assignment. One, one reason was um, only to do it because we can. And at that time, we didn't even have the antibiotics yet. So we just wanted to make assignments of a very large membrane protein. Of course, we knew BAM-A has interesting structural biology. We, would, we were aiming at in studying interactions with substrates at a later point. So that was th the reason why we started to engage on this. And we knew it took years. And so we worked basically from 2014 to 20, or 20, or maybe 2015 to 2017, 18. My PhD student, Joe Baptiste Hartmann, did this fantastic job of, of doing those assignments, of heroic work. And in the end, we did them benefit. And that was then very fast. So I basically, with the darobactin, um, they had been trying very hard to identify the target. Uh, same for, for OMTA. And we could basically, having all these assignments, solve this within a matter of two weeks. Mm, but it was, of course, an investment of three, four years of work before. But yeah, um, that's, that's the true answer. Well, thank you. Uh, are there other questions from the panel? Okay. Um, let me ask a question. So. A fantastic talk. Um, Daryl Bacting, that um, compound, has these tryptophan uh, rings. And so do you think that compound has a natural tendency to be at the membrane water interface? And the protein is just kind of passively happened to have that particular strand or loop right there. So wh what comes first? What's the cause and what's the effect? Yes, very, very good question. So um, the compound, so, yeah. So BAM A is not a coincidental target. Um, Darabactin is produced by this photoraptor species and they live in a symbiotic way in the gut of a nematode. The nematode eats larvae and secretes then this darabactin to fight other bacteria that would like to share the same food. And so th th that's how it, 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 it call, came across evolutionarily. So this definitely targets, um, uh, targets BAM A. Um, indeed, it would by its uh, by, by the nature of this binding pocket, you could you're absolutely right. This could very well um, target similar binding pockets that are somewhere found as in other proteins and may have a, a membrane here. The tryptophan, as you know, we have these aromatic girdles in membrane proteins exactly at that height of the membrane. So um, there's also no coincidence that those are here found at that height and make favorable contacts to to the membrane. I can only speculate that there are perhaps no no other related uh, such sites, but I, I do not know. There are many questions now in the Q&A, could maybe you could... Yes, I am just studying them. So David Eliza asks about the exchange process between closed and open states and how it affects the interaction with the drug. Yes, yes, very good. So this is obviously a clear, clear and slow exchange. We try to measure the um, exchange uh, with, with ZZ exchange, we, we didn't see much. So this must be even slower than, than several seconds. Um, so basically in, in our preparation, in, in detergent mice cells, this behaves like two different species. Nonetheless, this is of course dynamic. And at the moment you add the compound, this shifts 
in, of course, on the time scale that you have to prepare the sample completely to, to one of the two states. I then have another question from Walt Masewski. And he asks, um, he comments that folding of OMS by BAM A is reminiscent of protein translation on the ribosome, which is another mechanism that's inhibited by antibiotics. Do you see any par parallels between the two processes? Ex excellent point, yes. So we have here a natural compound again, like also many ribosome targeted antibiotics that inhibit a central pathway in biogenesis, an essential pathway in biogenesis. And they do this by blocking a, a site, a, a catalytic site where the substrates have to funnel through. So these parallels are perfectly, very, very well spotted, yes. A next question comes from Mario Schubert and he asks, about interactions between darobactin and the protein, which side chains, if any, are involved. I now do not recall whether you exclusively talked about backbone interactions, so uh, you may want to um, entertain this question. Yes, very good. I will actually share a slide that I show a slide that I did not show so far. So here's a, a detailed plot of, oh, no. Ah, moment, I have first to allow this slide. Okay. So here's the interaction, direct interaction. So we fit darabactin at the bottom and here's the BAME beta sheet one. And all the red interactions are the canonical beta strand interactions. All are there, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then here's two more to the next strands here, strands 16. And, and 15. And the blue ones are the side chain interactions. There's only two of them. And um, so, as I said, this is strongly dominated by um, backbone. And this also explains why the same compound can work against many different gram-negative bacteria, because it's not strongly dependent on the local amino acid uh, composition. And we also validate this by point mutations. Maybe in basically in alanine scan, you can see this here, has hardly any effect compared to wild type and affinity. And then for only this compound, which does have a side chain interaction, we have a, some, some change, but this is not, um, not, 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 not sufficiently strong to make a resistance. So the resistance mutations are found in completely different places um, and, and they're actually not, not happening at all in, 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 vitro, in vivo. So um, that's also maybe a, a point coming back to the question asked before about the ribosome, because we are targeting here a site that is uh, used in biogenesis, there is basically to, to date no um, resistance mutation known that would not at the same time also inhibit the pathogenicity of the, of the bacteria. If you mutate the affinity to the bacteria, way, you also lose the affinity to your, your, your own substrates that you would like to process. Well, I have here two questions which bear on sample preparation. Geoffrey Bodenhausen asks, is tyrobactin a tough challenge for organic chemistry. And Luis Ramirez asks, how were the nanobodies designed and produced for stabilizing each conformation? Yeah, yeah. So, full synthesis of darobactin is under, on the way. I know organic chemists that immediately took that challenge. So right now, all we have is coming from fermentation, isolation from natural sources, but people are on the way. And as I hear, this is doable. Um, it's perhaps not super easy, but it's a doable thing and it's as usual a challenge for the organic chemist. And I um, would not be surprised if we see the synthesis soon. Um, the nanobody preparation, yes, um, we did the full way. So you, you um, immunize alpacas with, with protein preparations and you can do this with membrane proteins in detergent mice cells. You can then later isolate um, binders, select them first by ELISA, by phage display. And then we used, maybe I can also show a slide here. Um, yeah. And then how we selected this also by NMR. So yeah, you, you, you know, go, go through, through the alpacas and then, and then you have binders 
And we then did some sequence analysis to group uh, similar ones in the same uh, and, and avoid screening the same, the same ones or similar ones. And in the end, we had five, which we did all produce and screen by NMR. And from that one, we then selected those that interested us most for the structure determination. And, and these were then the ones that I showed you. And here's basically how this looks. You have, you have uh, your, your standard spectrum, you add any of these nanobodies. So we have one here, which basically doesn't make any change to the spectrum. So this seems to bind somewhere and basically cause no uh, change to this two-state equilibrium. But then here, this one led to rather low quality spectra. And then here, the blue one and the, uh, the red one and the blue one, they selective uh, then stabilized one of the two states, and that was exactly what we were looking for. And this, of course, generally applicable if you have other proteins that have this two-state or multi-state behavior, you could do exactly this and screen for stabilizers of one state. And NMI is beautiful for this because for obvious reasons. There are another two questions that you can comment on jointly. Gina Radford, well, they all start by saying beautiful talk. I shouldn't uh, suppress this. Then, uh, do you know how Dalobactin finds beta strand one in BAM A? Does it get through the outer membrane to bind from the periplasm or does it tunnel through BAM A to find its target? Yeah. So that's uh, Gina Radford. And then Him Wan Sheng asks how nanodisks stabilize only one confirmation. Could you comment on the mechanism? And there is actually a third question by Joost Liebau, who says the open state of BAM A seems to be the functional one to which also the Bactin binds. What is the role of the other closed state? I think that all these three questions can be commented on together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the first is the, the, the pathway of darabactin going to its site of, of, of uh, action. And this is a big open question. And we have been wondering about this a lot. And many people ask this question. And we, we simply don't know. So um, we th actually, it's too big. Uh, we have typically in, in, in gram negative bacteria a size limit for translocation across uh, general pores like OMF or so. And so darabactin is violating this size rule. So, it might either go through the BAM A lumen or it might also slide along the outside of, of BAM A to its side. And we have some empty simulations where we, they suggest there might be a low energy barrier for the latter possibility so that it goes diffuses through the membrane to its side. So that's kind of the idea we favor at the moment. But we would be, would be very glad for any good ideas to really test this experimentally because it's not, not trivial to test this, how it gets there. Um, and then next question was, how does the nanobody stabilize each of the states? Um, um, and I mean, they do this by, by direct binding. So, so they bind here. And it's actually an, an important point also that there's an allosteric coupling now from the top side to, to this gate region all the way. So either this one on the nanobody F7 here, so the crystal structures, they bind in very different places. And, and this then seems to open and close this gate. Um, and now about the one question about the functional state, I should now say something which we do not see in the solution NMR spectroscopy of the barrel only, that um, namely the entire, so here is some, some very nice work from, from Daniel Kahn's lab that was published recently. Sorry, I don't have the reference shown here, but I'll be happy to provide if, Someone doesn't find it. This is from Nature earlier, earlier last year. Uh, no, earlier this year. So this is um, the bum barrel here in, 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 in Salmon again, in the canonical closed state. And the green one is the outward open state. It has also been observed many or so several times in, in different structures that is, it can really here completely open up in the scissor wave fashion. And um, I think also Sheena Redford has, has seen this in some of her preparations. And then here in the Kana structure, there is a substrate attached to it and uh, is in the process of, of inserting in the membrane. There's actually a whole second barrel attached to it. It's following essentially our, the, the mechanism I, I showed initially with this hybrid barrel formation. And intriguingly, now the Starobactin, if you elongate this last strand, 
the phenylalanine, which actually in this particular substrate is a tryptophan, comes exactly at the same place as, as the phenylalanine of thyrobactin. So this is exactly following the canonical way of, of interaction with this last strand. So there is still work to be done. We understand exactly the dynamics of this opening and the substrate insertion. This is now, now work to be done. And we hope we also can, can contribute this uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. We have no more questions on my list. And I think that's a good moment to thank you and to return to the second lecture of this morning. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, yeah, I'm uh, very happy to be able to uh, introduce Pat Rovo as the second speaker of today's session. And uh, Petra studied uh, chemistry at the Erdrich Laurent University in Budapest. That was probably pronounced wrong, but you can imagine what it, what it is. And she was actually enticed to NMR spectroscopy very early on because of her uh, teacher, Janusz Rohan. Uh, uh, who danced the spin dynamics for her, as she told me a few times, in fact. Um, then she did her PhD with uh, Andras Pretzel on uh, chip cage mini proteins, and very influential for her work um, during her PhD, PhD time was uh, a stay in uh, Jeff Pang's lab in uh, Indiana, in Notre Dame, where she was exposed to uh, relaxation and relaxation theory on uh, deuterium spins, in fact, as well as its uh, mathematical description. Um, then she actually did an extremely uh, productive and very independent postdoc uh, in my group, uh, first at the MPI BPC in Göttingen uh, from 2014, and then moved with us to Munich in uh, 2016, uh, where she started the topic of solid state NMR relaxation in my group, which was very influential and very important for us, uh, in particular 15N and proton R1 row relaxation. And her success was actually uh, shaped by skills uh, or unique skills in uh, not only mathematics, but also Mathematica, the program, which uh, really has helped to bestow the community with uh, a unique expertise and uh, or with which she has been able to, 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 yeah, to provide uh, the community with lots of uh, insights in, into this uh, topic. So from uh, 2018, she started her own group in Munich and uh, continuing on relaxation in solids and solution, uh, also including particular uh, nucleic acid uh, protein interactions. Petra got several awards and fellowships. Uh, most importantly, the UMR Young Scientist Award awarded uh, at the UMR in 2017. Um, and um, yeah, I'm very happy uh, to be able to introduce her here and uh, I'm very much looking forward to the talk now, and I guess the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I, okay. So thanks again for the invitation. It's, it's a really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, and I hope you will enjoy and even learn something today about relaxation, relaxation theory and how it is done under fast magic angle spinning. Um, I think I don't really have to introduce how powerful NMR is to study uh, proteins and protein dynamics, how things move on a wide range of timescales, uh, because uh, most of you should be already familiar with this concept. Uh, but I think solid state relaxation and solid state um, relaxation dispersion methods, it's a bit new for most of you. So today I will focus on the technique, which is called NERD. NERD stands for Near Rotary Resonance Relaxation Dispersion. And as the name suggests, it's a relaxation dispersion techniques, and technique, meaning that uh, we measure R1 row spin locked relaxation and follow uh, the relaxation rate as a function of the uh, effective irradiation field strengths. In solid state, one can distinguish two different types of relaxation dispersion mechanisms and two distinct regions in the dispersion curve. One uh, is the block mechanical relaxation dispersion regime, which uh, is the same what one observes in solution state. And uh, that is due to the chemi different chemical shift of exchanging species. 
If this exchange uh, happens on the microsecond, millisecond timescale motion, then we can detect a dispersion curve where by applying higher spin lock frequency, we quench the interaction and observe this curve, which could be fitted, fitted with this block mcconnell uh, relaxation equation system. In solid state NMR, due to the presence of uh, magic angle spinning and uh, some interactions in which we will go into detail a, a bit later, we'll have another region in the uh, relaxation dispersion profile, which is this uh, near rotor resonance relaxation dispersion. As the name suggests, uh, it is near the rotor resonance condition, which means that we are approaching uh, with the effective field strength, the frequency regime, uh, which corresponds to the uh, spinning frequency. And uh, we should only just approach it and not hit it, because if we would hit it, then in solid state magic angle spinning experiment, there is recoupling, and then we would not observe relaxation, not the coherent, incoherent motion, but the coherent uh, interactions. So that we shall avoid. Um, to get there, we have to start from the basics, and the basics starts always with Hamiltonians. So we are analyzing the time-dependent Hamiltonian. It can be dissected into two regions. Uh, we can talk about the deterministic Hamiltonian, uh, where uh, the time dependence comes from uh, the fact that we are spinning the sample and we are applying radio frequency irradiation and that has some time dependence, but these are all the parts which we are aware of, and we are using the deterministic Hamiltonian to study the stochastic Hamiltonian. So the stochastic part is in which we are interested in, that's what contains the random motion. And uh, by changing the spinning frequency or by changing the irradiation field strengths, we can get access uh, to information about the random motion. And to do that, we just need to solve the Redfield uh, relaxation equation. Uh, so this is the master equation uh, written in the interaction representation. And to write this interaction representation, we have to get there. In solid state, there is no tumbling. Uh, so therefore, we need to define several consecutive frame transformations uh, to describe how the uh, spins are evolving over time. So first we start in the principal axis frame where our interaction tensors are um, diagonal and uh, then we define the motion uh, with respect to the molecular frame or the crystalline frame. And these molecules are sitting inside the rotor so we can describe their re relationship with another frame transformation and or rotor uh, is in a magic angle spinning experiment uh, can be defined uh, as with respect to the external magnetic field where the angle between the external magnetic field and or rotor is this magic angle 54.7 degrees. So we have just arrived uh, to the laboratory frame uh, and then to factor out all the dominating Zeeman interactions uh, from our equations, we should go to the interaction representation. And uh, to do so, we uh, use the doubly rotating frame transformation. So we rotate first with the Larmor frequency and uh, tilt the coordinates uh, with the effective tilt angle, and then rotate again with the uh, spin lock field strengths. So with these constitutive transformation, one can actually describe really precisely the full form of the Hamiltonian, and then that enables us to solve the equation and get the uh, explicit relaxation rate equations that are valid under magic angle spinning and uh, continuous wave irradiation. And I don't write here down the whole equation. Uh, in, in case you're interested, I can show it later on. It's just too large. So we just, uh, I just highlight the parts which are the most relevant for us or for the nerd effect. So here I list the uh, relaxation equation for the heteronuclear dipolar relaxation and for the homonuclear dipolar relaxation. They are quite similar, uh, but uh, they are different on other sense. So you might remember uh, that the spectral density function is a continuously decreasing function, which has the highest value at zero frequency. Uh, in 
solution state, the R1 row, or so the R2 relaxation, which is really similar to R1 row, uh, that depends on the spectral density at zero frequency. In R1 row experiment, that depends on the effective field strength uh, depend, uh, frequency. In uh, solid state, instead of uh, zero component, we have the linear combination of the effective field and the spinning frequency. So in case we have such a situation when we hit with the effective field strengths, uh, the spinning frequency, or we are really close to it, then this part of the equation where we have omega e minus omega r will become zero. So then we can achieve a J0 component. But then with the changing of the effective field strengths or the spinning frequency, we can really nicely cover the first part of the spectral density function, which is related to slow motion. So this nerd relaxation uh, dispersion measurement enables us to study microsecond timescale motion. So it is most sensitive to uh, the regime between uh, 40 and 5 microseconds. So as, as we see, these equations plotted as a function of the effective field uh, show an increasing rate around the rotor resonance condition and half a, uh, twice rotor resonance condition. But if the motion gets uh, faster and faster, then we will not see after some time anything. So at one microsecond, the profile is really flat. Uh, the difference between the heteronuclear dipolar relaxation and the homonuclear dipolar relaxation is the fact that the homonuclear dipolar relaxation in on resonance conditions have this component present, where uh, which results in the uh, horror recoupling condition, where the effective field strengths, when it equals or really close to the half of the spinning speed, then is when the J0 component uh, will hit and come into play. Uh, if in case for carbon relaxation, in which I'm interested in nowadays, uh, one needs to take into account that uh, carbons, the chemical shift difference of carbons can be really different. So we cannot apply just the uh, simple homonuclear dipolar uh, interaction uh, frame. So we have to take into account that the effective field strengths and the, um, the tilt angles are different. Uh, and for all situations, then the equations will be somewhat more complicated. Uh, but those could be also derived, uh, taking all the secular terms into account. And then we end up with the outer relaxation rates and for the cross relaxation rates. So one has to keep in mind that for homonuclear dipolar relaxation, there's always the outer relaxation and the cross relaxation. Uh, luckily for two spin systems, uh, for simple simulations, it's uh, enough just to sum these up. And that is what we record as our bundle relaxation. For larger systems, it leads to uh, multi-exponential decays. And in this plot, I show how the um, NERD profile uh, depends on the effective uh, field, uh, which is the spin log field strength, but the effective what is felt by the spins, and on the effective tilt angle. So when the chemical shift difference of the two carbons are uh, zero, uh, then we see a nice profile where we have the half of the resonance condition nerd effect and the rotor resonance condition, and they have the ratio of two to one. While at, in an off resonance measurement, we would see different ratios and we would even see the twice rotor resonance uh, condition uh, corresponding to uh, this part of the screen. Uh, but depending on the different chemical shift, uh, we will see different situations uh, where the half root resonance condition peak and the uh, off resonance um, condition situations are completely different. So uh, in the extrema, when the chemical shift difference is so large, uh, that we cannot even observe them, then it resembles the heteronuclear relaxation case, while on resonance it is, uh, while when the chemical shift difference is zero, then it all resembles the 
proton proton homonuclear dipolar interaction case. Uh, in carbon labeled samples, we need to take into account that it's not just uh, one interaction which can contribute to such a nerd profile, but uh, for example, an alanine uh, can have bipolar interaction with the beta carbons, and also it is interacting with the uh, carbonyl carbon. Then we have a CSA interaction. The CSA resembles the heteronuclear dipolar relaxation in the sense that it only contributes to the rotary resonance and twice rotary resonance conditions, while the homonuclear dipolar interaction, they have contributions at the half rotary resonance condition. But if we have a protonated system, the majority of the interactions are coming from the protons. So if there is a strong proton background, uh, and those protons are moving on the microsecond timescale, then that is what will overwhelm uh, all the relaxation profiles. So therefore, it's beneficial to use iteration or have a situation when the protons are moving much faster than microsecond. And I will show you two examples. First, a simple example for 15 and nerd. Uh, we studied iterated SH3. Uh, which is a nice uh, model system, easily produced and iterated. And uh, there we were interested in functional motion. Uh, we did find some functional motion, but in this uh, slide, what I show as an example is a crystallization artifact. So we observed that these four residues have really similar nerve profiles with increasing relaxation rates as we approach the rotor resonance condition. So we were spinning at 55 kilohertz. Uh, but in the sequence of the protein, these four residues are far away from each other. Um, in, in pairs, they are close, but not all four of them. But then when we looked closer to the crystal structure, we saw that in the uh, the crystal crystal interface, they are really close in space. And most probably, the motion of this arginine side chain, uh, as it um, interacts with the tryptophan uh, side chain, uh, if this motion happens on the seven microsecond time scale, then it influences the relaxation of the D62 and E7 residues. Uh, so therefore, uh, it was a nice proof of the concept that NERT 15 and NERT works, but one can also observe uh, functionally irrelevant motions. Uh, in another study, what I attempted uh, quite recently, I studied a uh, carbon NERT uh, of a tandem repeat proteins. Uh, these uh, tandem repeat proteins are uh, protein polymers. Uh, the, their sequence derived from uh, squid ring teas protein, and uh, they have really miserable spectra in proton nitrogen dimension, so only carbons could be studied. And this sample was a protonated sample, and I attempted to do some carbon nerd on them, and luckily I could see some effects and some interesting uh, other artifacts as well. So as I said, this is a protonated system. So therefore, when I saw a large decrease of the relaxation rates at the beginning of the nerve profiles, I suspected that these cannot be block macronal relaxation dispersion because we have protonated system. Uh, these parts are just due to the unsuppressed coherent contributions, which are always present uh, in protonated systems due to the uh, dense proton-proton coupling networks. So faster spinning could help to get rid of this, but even at 55 kilohertz, um, I could see this effect for certain sites. So I, I did see it for carbonyls and for most of the uh, alpha carbons, um, a bit for an alanine C-beta, and uh, there was a proline C-beta um, peak, uh, which showed really elevated motion, and for that I didn't see any coherent contribution at the beginning of their profile. And in terms of what else can we uh, observe were these bumps, uh, which are uh, due to carbon-carbon homonuclear dipolar relaxation. So there is some uh, few tens of microsecond motion present in the sample, and that leads uh, to this uh, elevated peak. And besides, there is lots of motion uh, which would contribute to the full rotor resonance condition. 
uh, for proline and the methyl group, I only saw um, the full rotor resonance condition at nerd effect, signaling the fact that there is no carbon-carbon bond which would move on the microsecond time scale. And here I just show some uh, peculiarities how this was actually done and analyzed. Uh, so I recorded all these measurements of resonance, uh, setting the effective tilt angle to 35.3 degrees and uh, recorded the um, relaxation rates of, uh, at different offsets and resulting in different offset angles. And uh, then the analysis shows, so the curve is taken from this point and that shows this small bump is just the elongation of this other uh, curve. So if I would re-record the spectra, I would definitely set the effective tilt angle to 54 degrees or maybe even attempt on resonance measurement, but that is for the future. Uh, NERD comes with many complications. Uh, as I already mentioned, the coherence contributions at the beginning of the uh, relaxation profile is a problem. Deuteration helps. Uh, so in deuterated samples that uh, should not be a problem or spinning faster, that always helps. Um, as I already mentioned, one should not hit the rotor resonance conditions because then there is recoupling uh, and we don't measure anymore any incoherent contributions. For carbons uh, and systems with multiple relaxation pathways, uh, several other um, relaxation pathways shall be considered. There are the auto and cross relaxations and also cross correlated relaxation between any pairs of interactions. So that can complicate the analysis a lot. And uh, from the theoretical perspective, one should take into account that the re red field relaxation theory breaks down for slow motion. Uh, so microsecond time scale fast microsecond time scale motion is still uh, okay uh, when the extent of motion is not too large. And so far what I've seen in samples, that was still the case, uh, but that should be also double checked with some simulations. And uh, in solid state, there is no mono exponential decay ever. Uh, so everything is multi exponential, but we still attempt to fit them with mono exponentials with some uh, tweaks. Uh, so one should, for example, always consider the first part of the uh, relaxation decays. And uh, from an experimental point of view, uh, approaching the resonance conditions can be quite demanding for the probe. Uh, so that should be taken into account, maybe spin slower uh, if that's a problem, or use off-resonance measurements because then the RF field strengths are much smaller while you can increase the effective field strengths. Uh, so as a, a take-home message, I would suggest you to use FASTMES to get rid of all the uh, coherent contributions. So that enables you to access incoherent motion, and that also increases your sensitivity and resolution. Uh, use strong enough RF field strengths uh, to get uh, to suppress all the uh, coherent contributions at the beginning of the profiles, and it's especially true for protonated systems. Uh, you should avoid hitting the resonance conditions, both the half rotor resonance or the rotor resonance condition. And uh, if you can afford, uh, use selective labeling because then you know what's in your sample and then you can tailor your, your experiments so that uh, no interaction of different relaxation pathway will contribute uh, to your profiles. And uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, the people here at LMU who helped a lot with this uh, study, especially Romeo, who did most of the spectrum processing and peak picking, and uh, Zekai, who did some uh, simulations for me. And I got samples from, mainly from uh, Malik Demiral from Penn State University, uh, and the SA3 study was done together with uh, Rasmus. And I also thank uh, Paul Shonda for nice discussions uh, throughout the um, relaxation analysis and Ilya for helping me with spin up simulations and I'm ready for questions and thank you for your attention. Good. Um, thank you so much for a very nice talk and in fact we learned something not just about um, your results but about theory of relaxation in general and um, 
I'll just go through the questions uh, right away. And it's actually two on the line already. So Christoph actually asked something and he says, thank you for the very great talk. You and others have developed a variety of powerful tools to determine dynamics by source state NMR. Many tools for dynamics determination in solution state are implemented in the program Dynamic Center. Cest, um, let's jump in, had enemy and so on, which is known for automatically determine, automatic determination of T1 or T2. Expanding this program to solid state NMR, which method is the most appropriate to be implemented first, most powerful and easiest in your view? Um, so I think if one wants to go to the easiest, then I would suggest measure and use deuterated samples for which the block mechanical relaxation dispersion profile can be equally well exploited as in solution states. So then there is no need for even modification of the uh, pulse sequence, unless I mean you take out the gradients and then you can you are ready to go. Um, for nerd measurements, that's also not challenging for from a measurement point of view. So this is just the same pulse sequence using higher field strengths. The analysis part uh, is way much more complicated, uh, so that I even don't know whether the dynamic center includes that, but I would always suggest you to do your own fitting. Do not trust any other program than the what you have written. Lucas uh, Simons asks, not really a question, but there is no chat. And so, super cool talk. It's cool to see how all the interactions affect the nerd profiles. Okay. Then Supriya Fatia says, nice talk, Petra. Did you try CPMG type ID experiments in the solid state also? Uh, I have not tried, but I have read other papers who did try. And the, major, the, the conclusion of those studies is that when you let the spin just to evolve freely, so without any spin lock, uh, then coherent contribution kicks in and then your rates, what you detect is way much higher than the actual rates. So in principle, the CPMG R2 rate and the R1 row R2 rate in non-resonance measurement should be really similar or the same, uh, but it's not. So it, it can be orders of magnitude different. So then uh, T2 relaxation like the Haneke or CPMG will not work. I don't think it will work even for deuterated system, systems at really high spinning speeds. So maybe one can try, but I still doubt. But at least um, qualitatively, there qualitatively are the trends, the same trends. systems, uh, qualitatively it can help. So Walt Masewski asks, um, can you use the observation of coherent dephasing as a way to establish a bound, upper or lower, on the motion at a site? Um, probably. I didn't go that much into uh, analysis of the first part of this um, profiles. Uh, so this is the fun flag coefficients, what one could derive. And um, I have attempted to, to make sense of it, but I, I couldn't. Uh, so it's the relationship between the proton densities and their interactions and their the number of different residues contributing to that decay is just too complex to, to make any sense of it. So I would suggest you just go for the incoherent part of these curves to, for, for meaningful information. Ilya Kuprov uh, says, red field theory is surprisingly resilient. We also see that it apparently works two orders of magnitude out of its formal validity, uh, formal validity range. Any thoughts on why exactly it is so good? Um, I have also saw it, and but I even read it in a paper today in, from 1985 from Alexander Vega, who also said that that Radfield theory is not that strict. Uh, so what uh, he also wrote and um, other papers as well, that as long as the T2 is uh, much longer than the um, correlation time, uh, then it all, is all fine. So that comes when the order parameter, the S square, uh, is relatively large. So we don't have high amplitude motions. And then 
the derived R1 row rates are relatively small in, in the measurable regime. So it's not hundreds, but just tens. Uh, then in that regime, the relaxation theory seems to be working, which is nice because then we have analytical equations to work with and fit our data with. At least it seems like um, other error bars or other uh, um, peculiarities of the data, like for example, as you said, the exponential fitting are just more of a problem than the failure of red field. Oh, there are so problems as well. So this is just one of them and uh, yeah. just not that. Art hard. is actually asking a, a yeah. question. So oh. may, I, oh, uh, may I come in with a question? Yes. At this point, I really appreciated your clear presentation. Thank it you. reminded me of long times ago when we worked on relaxation in solution. Now, it, I have two questions. The first is, I seem to realize that instead of us in solution NMR using the frequency of the Brownian motion as a reference, you use the rot rotor uh, rotary frequency as a reference. Did I get this straight? Um, yes. So we don't in solid state. There is no tumbling, uh, so we cannot use any such motion as that the limit for where we can detect relaxation. Um, in principle, so the read equations could be written even beyond the spinning frequency, uh, but then just the theory breaks down more and more and more. Uh, so because we are spinning and that has a frequency, uh, that's a good reference to use and relate ourselves to. So this gives you the possibility to vary the rotor frequency and so you have much more flexibility than we have when the reference frequency is imposed. On the other hand, the Brownian motion is a natural frequency, not an experimental uh, uh, imposed um, condition. And so we can possibly learn more from referencing to the Brownian motion than to an experimental parameter. Yes, uh, so in solid state, so because we are interested in incoherent motion, so there is still some motion and those are also random, although not fully averaged out through a molecular tumbling, but in a certain area, uh, they are averaging out. So we can use that and that is what we are interested in. Uh, so we still have uh, this uh, stochastic phenomenon going on in our sample. That leads to my second question. What can you tell us about the molecular motions that are revealed by the relaxation data? Are these isotropic motions, anisotropic motions, local motions, global motions? What can you tell us? Uh, local motions, for sure, because we have site-specific information and then we see it for certain sites and we don't see it for other sites. Uh, and I would not really go into details about the anisotropy and isotropy. For My data is not good enough and it's really hard to gather enough accurate experimental data on that, that one can comment on the isotropy or anisotropy of motion. So I would just say these sites move, other sites are not moving. And uh, when there are multiple sites which show a really similar behavior and they are closed in space, then we can assume they are moving together. They are involved in the same process, but I wouldn't go beyond that. One could, and there are attempts to, to do different jump models but those are just way too complicated. Okay, thank you. Your answer is as straight as your presentation before. All right. So as long as we're going to talk about nuances of red field theory, um, I had two questions. Yes. One is, I assume, um, but you can tell me, that the dynamic frequency shift, the imaginary part of the correlation function can be basically ignored as we usually do in solution in your experiments? 
I ignore them. I didn't ever consider that I should not ignore them. Uh -huh. uh, but I think, so this could be also taken into account. No, no problem. And then of course, Malcolm Levitt has pointed out that Lindblodian theory is you know, kind of the proper way of doing red field theory. Um, do all these experiments in the solid state need to be reformulated or do they still fit well enough, do you think, within red field theory? I don't know that theory. I'm sorry. Neither do I. I've only heard Malcolm talk about it. Okay, okay. 